Hello, my name's Ian Scales. You're watching Telecom TV's Alternative Agenda programme. And today, I'm talking with William Webb. William is the CEO of the Weightless Special Interest Group, and he works for New York. First of all, we should talk about Weightless. Tell me, first of all, what is Weightless? Weightless is a standard, so equivalent to Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. It's a standard for a, a radio level system. So again, just like Bluetooth, it covers the, the radio technology and the, the logic that sits behind that effectively to deliver data. And it's targeted specifically at uh, what's sometimes called the machine to machine or Internet of Things agenda, uh, looking at devices that generate relatively small amounts of data in small packets, but huge numbers of them around the world. So an important part of this effort, William, is the use of white spaces. Yes, so we set it up specifically for machine to machine because what we observed was that the machine to machine world was not growing as quickly as, as many anticipated. There's long been predictions that there could be 50 billion connected devices by 2020. But what we see at the moment is only a few tens of millions or hundreds of millions, which is still a large number, but nothing like the overall size of the market. And when we looked at the market, our observation was that there was no technology that met all of the needs of the machine to machine market, which primarily are very low cost, both for the chipset that goes in the machine and any ongoing data fees. Very good coverage, so that wherever these machines were, even if they were deep inside a house, they could communicate. Global availability, in order that you can take machines from one country to another if needs be. And uh, extremely long battery life, because many of these machines don't have any external power supplies. And the last thing you want to do is be going around changing the batteries in every car park sensor every few months. So when we looked at those, we discovered that there was no standard that could meet all those and that a new standard would, would be a good fit to achieve that. But with any new technology, any new wireless technology, you need some new radio spectrum to put it into. And that for a long time was the key blocker that prevented us from coming up with a new wireless technology. There was just no spectrum where we could sit this technology, ideally that was available on a global basis. And then along came TV white space uh, about three or four years ago, the enthusiasm started to grow behind it and it became clear to us that it was going to happen in the US, the UK and, and, and we're fairly sure globally. And that beautifully fits the requirements of the machine area. So the combination of the white space spectrum and a new technology custom designed for machine to machine, we think is what's necessary to hit that 50 billion or however many billion it turns out to be of devices. Weightless operates quite down low um, in the spectrum band and it's able to reach the places that say 4G cellular or Wi-Fi can't. Absolutely, so it's in the frequency band between 400 and 800 megahertz, the UHF band. Uh, that's the band where TV signals are currently sent and they go a long, long way. You can often see TV transmissions at over 100 miles from a TV mast. And as we've seen with the cellular operators, they're tending to try now to find lower frequency spectrum in order to get better coverage. So we're seeing this realisation that actually, particularly where you don't need enormously high data rates or huge amounts of capacity, that low frequency spectrum brings you huge advantages. In our case in particular, we need to get really good coverage, but we need to be able to offer the machines very low tariffs for their data. Now, if we needed enormous numbers of base stations to cover the country, then the cost of the network would be high and the fees we would then have to charge per device would also be high, probably too high for the market to bear. So it's critical for waitlist to pick a low frequency spectrum such that you can get really good coverage, better than cellular, with fewer base stations and then deliver very low cost infrastructure. So an important aspect is this idea of being able to share the spectrum with other users of it. Could you explain that and how Ofcom in the UK has got involved in that? It's, it's very important. So this is a completely new way of accessing spectrum. In the past, we've had licensed spectrum, which, for example, the cellular operators buy, and they uniquely own their own bit of spectrum to do what they like with. And we've had completely unlicensed spectrum, of which the, the Wi-Fi band at 2.4 gigahertz is the prime example, where any number of things can come in and contend, and we've seen Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and, and other devices pile in there. White space is actually on licensed access to licensed spectrum. So it's blending those two together. So there's already a licensed user of that band. It's the TV transmitters and receivers, and to, to some degree as well, wireless microphone usage. So any use of that band needs to protect those. 
And that means there's some quite complex rules designed to make sure that these unlicensed users, like waitlists, don't interfere with the licensed users, and that involves database lookups and all sorts of things. And some of those rules are still now being defined in detail. And they define the, the power levels that are, you're allowed to use. And then also, to some degree, control what types of systems are viable in that space, and then perhaps even how they might um, interwork with each other, although at the moment that's perhaps a bit more of a free-for-all, just as we see in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So how confident can you be, William, that the way you develop the standard will mesh with the way the regulators around the world develop their requirements? Um, it's hard to be sure about that because, of course, we haven't seen the regulatory requirements everywhere. What we can say is that it absolutely meets the US requirements, which are now finalised, and um, the US is open for business for white space access. Um, they uh, appear to meet the current UK requirements, which are just being finalised. As you mentioned, there's a consultation that's just closing now from Ofcom that sets out in some detail those requirements and we do meet those. We don't know what will happen in other countries, but we strongly suspect other countries will tend to follow the lead of the US and the UK, and hence we'll end up with something very similar. Weightless as well is evolving, so should there be a country that has quite different requirements, then we can evolve the standard in order to meet those generally, as long as it's not too radical a departure. And eventually when it becomes really successful, I suspect no national regulator will want to be too different from other regulators because it would actually prevent the use in their country of that particular technology. So in the same way that no regulator now will come up with a standard that will prevent Wi-Fi working in their country, I think in, in the long course we'll see waitlists to some degree um, imposing its own requirements onto the regulator. But we're, we're a fair way off that one yet. So the way waitlists will develop will basically track the way Wi-Fi developed? I think so. That's, that's a, a fairly good example uh, it started off in one country, it grew, gathered a lot of momentum, um, regulations happened in other countries. In some cases those regulations were different. So in Europe, for example, we had this requirement to detect and avoid radar systems and that got added on and then Wi-Fi devices were modified in subsequent years to add that particular requirement in. So you can see some kind of iteration and give and take in that space and I suspect we'll probably see that happen here too. Okay, so William, imagine that I'm an investor in Waitlist and you're trying to convince me that this is a really good idea. How can I be sure that over a long period of time other technologies like 4G cellular or Wi-Fi even aren't able to replicate the kind of capabilities that Waitlist has? Um, it's, a, it's a very happy situation that I don't think there are other technologies that are direct competitors to us. So. Um, there are four key requirements for, for the machine-to-machine -machine world, and, and that is very low cost, long battery life, very good coverage, and global availability. And if you take a look at, there's two, broadly two groups of competing technologies. One I would, I would characterize as the short-range technologies, which would include Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Zigbee, uh, and there are some other proprietary ones there. They certainly achieve the low cost, and they can achieve the long battery life with things like Bluetooth low energy. But what they don't have is, is really good coverage. So you can't be sure that your heart rate monitor will be able to find a Wi-Fi hotspot at the point in time when you need it most desperately, or that indeed your car will be able to link to a Wi-Fi hotspot as it drives around the city. The other type of um, system is the cellular types of systems, and they do achieve the coverage and the global availability, but not the $2 cost and not the long battery life. So we have no one single standard or technology that can meet all of those requirements at the same time. And that's where I think waitlist is quite unique. Now, of course, it's always possible that somebody could come up with a technology and say, this technology meets those requirements too. Waitlist, though, is an open standard. And our observation is that the only successful wireless technologies are global open standards. If you list every wireless technology that you currently use, apart from perhaps your garage door opener, I think you'll, you'll agree that they're all open global standards, and hence the reason why we decided to do that for waitlist. So if somebody came along with a proprietary technology, I, my, my perception based on history would be that that would not be any sort of competition because people would head for the open global standard. 
And we see no other open global standard at the moment being developed in this particular space. So in the long run in this industry, everybody's talking about the development of a heterogeneous network where you have lots of different radio standards basically using the same infrastructure. Can you see weightless essentially becoming one of those standards over the longer term? I'd very much like it to. So I agree, very, I agree with your premise that what we see is operators now running 2G and 3G and soon 4G networks uh, and perhaps increasingly other systems all in the same kind of area. And then it does make sense to do that with as few boxes as possible and a few cables and a few antennas. So I think we're, we're seeing multiple different standards all being operated simultaneously but with a collapsing footprint. And weightless is going to be deployed as a cellular kind of network with a very similar sort of architecture to current cellular systems, perhaps closest to 2G systems. So to collapse it into that overall mix would seem very sensible. So what kind of network operator is going to deploy weightless, do you think? Is it going to be the big cellular boys that we know and love already, or will there be specialist M2M network providers? I think it could go one of two ways. So if you look at it logically and you say, well, which companies out there are best placed to do this, then you conclude it's going to be the mobile operators because they have the masts, the backhaul, the power, the experience of doing this, the brand awareness, um, the understanding of using spectrum, the ability to, to sell M to M to corporates. They have all those things in place. And so you'd think that they would be the, the obvious candidates to do this. Equally, history teaches us that often newer technologies catch the bigger players by surprise. And we see other entities who don't have a, uh, an inherent interest in that space coming in and doing something. And we see this so often with the Googles and, and um, the Samsungs and so on coming along and doing things somewhat differently. And it's interesting, for example, that um, one of the board members of the Waitlist Standards Board is Cable and Wireless, who are coming at it from a different point of view they're coming at it from the point of view that they're an entity that serves corporate customers with whatever their communications requirements are. And they may well want to serve them with a machine-to-machine -machine system as well as their existing other systems. And they also have a fair amount of infrastructure and other capabilities. So it could be an entity like that. Or it could be some completely new player, as we've seen in the past in the cellular world, for example, when three entered as a completely new player. Uh, that could happen too. I really don't know. Yes. It, could it could be different answers in different countries. We could see this evolve over time. We could see smaller players first that are then bought out by larger players. The other interesting point is that for some applications, you don't need to go straight away to national coverage. So, for example, one of the classics for machine to machine is the so-called smart city. And by definition, you only need to cover the city to enable the smart city. And here in Cambridge, for example, we have cover the entirety of Cambridge with six base stations. So that's a fairly easy to do initial deployment. So we could see a small scale operator, even ourselves or some, um, some other company, um, some other startup company, some other venture, doing that at a city level. And then perhaps with one or two cities enabled, some of the larger players might say, well, it's time for us to come in now and turn it into a national network. Okay, so where are you looking for the first outbreak of whitelist to take place? What sort of timescales are we looking at? So there's a number of things that need to come together to allow deployment of weightless networks. Uh, the first is that the standard itself needs to be completed. And the weightless standards body is now predicting with um, a high degree of confidence that we'll do this in March, April of this year. So we're already at version 0.9 of the standard and we'll just take that up to version 1.0, which is considered to be the first version that's stable and ready for, it, for implementation. Uh, in March or April. So that's an important milestone. Another one is the availability of equipment. So uh, Newell is already shipping base stations and um, we now have uh, samples of our first chipset that have come back from, from fabrication. So we're about six months away, I think, from seeing volume chipset availability, which is needed to enable any, any decent amount of application. And there's enough base station equipment out there now to start deploying systems. The other thing that's needed is the regulation is needed to, to be in place so that it's legal to deploy the systems. As I said, that can happen already in the US. Ofcom are predicting that 
um, in the latter half of this year, 2013, they will complete the regulation. So it seems to me that all the pieces come together during 2013. That might lead to 2014 perhaps being the year where we see significant deployments and then really ramping up fast in 2015. Those are my rough guesses of timescales. William, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.